Their wounds were doctored and bandaged up. If they fell, they had to go back and begin again. I watched as Henry Leonard made it through. Next bet with her injured arm <coughs> held close also made it. Then it was my turn. Run your fastest, Mary. Don't let them see that you're afraid. But wait. Chief Wildcat was talking to the chief of Shawnee Town and looking at me as if I were something he owned. Well, I looked down at my gold band and thought to myself, I'm Will Ingalls' wife. I'll not be the squaw of a Shawnee chief. But no, I guess he was telling the chief about me giving birth without making nary a whimper. And I did not have to run the gauntlet. That night, as I sat trying to sew our tattered dresses together, I motioned to Bet to come close. Bet, we mustn't show that we're afraid. And she answered me yet again, I'll see them heathen burn in hell. As I sewed, Georgie and Tommy were often out playing with the Indian boys in the village. One morning, as I sat there sewing, Two French traders came into the village. Their names were La Plante and Galar. And they came up and said, Madame, we propose to do business. You are a fine seamstress. These injured squalls can't sew. We have cloth. If you will sew ten shirts for the injured braids, we will give you one fine wool blanket. Winter will be here soon, and your boys will need its warmth. <clears throat> For one blanket, I replied, no. Eight, then he said. Eight shirts. Six, I replied. He thought for a moment and then said, Eh bien, toujours, Mary, you're in there world now. Six shirts, one blanket. As I finished a shirt, the engine braids would come and they would tie that shirt around a pole and swing it over their head and go whooping through the village, so proud to have a fine shirt sewn by such a fine Galar's wife, Little Otter, had given birth to a babe just three weeks before, a babe that had soon died. As I sewed and sewed from sunup to sundown, Little Otter began to take care of wee Betty Eleanor, even nursing her. Bet was horrified. You would let a heathen nurse your own? Bet, do it. 
to survive, I said. One day, as I sat there sewing yet another shirt, Tommy and Georgie were out playing ball with the Indian boys. Little Otter was taking care of the babe. Wildcat came and stopped and looked down at me. Come to Kaspota town with me, he said. Sons will be sons of chief. I looked at my gold wedding ring and I looked him in the eye. Sir, my sons already have a father. He stalked off, his face red with anger. The next morning, engines came on horseback into Shawnee Town, <coughs> their horses laden with furs. One by one, the captives were brought in front of the Indian chief's lodge. Piles of furs were exchanged, and the hostages led off. We were being fought with loads of furs. I watched as Bet was put atop a horse and led away, screaming my name. Then the two boys, no, no, I watched as an old Indian couple led me boys away. Galar and Laplante caught me as I fell to a dead faint. When I awoke, it was with a firm resolve. I would escape and find my way back to Will, following the river back home. I could tell by my rope calendar that it was mid-September. It would be winter time soon. But what about me babe? Would she starve as I starved on the trail? Her cries might bring engines upon us. We would both be killed, I knew. So I resolved to leave her with little Otter. I knew that she would raise this babe as her own. And from that day on, I resolved never to think of her again. The French traders and a band of the Indians motioned one morning to Gettle and I. We had not been ransomed. That we were to travel with them by canoe seven days down river to the salt flats at Big Bone. There we would be boiling water to get more brine, to preserve more of the deer meat for the winter food supply. When we arrived at Big Bone, we found huge mastodon tusks sticking up out of the salt flats. It didn't seem to bother the Frenchmen who used the skulls as tables for their midday snack. One evening, after Gattle and I had boiled salt all day to the point where our arms felt as if they would fall from our sockets, Le Platte and Goulart motioned to us. We're still hungry. We're hungry, they said. Go gather some wild grapes. I knew our chance had
had come. I've been talking to Gettle about escape for the last several weeks. You're crazy, Mary. Crazy. We'll be killed. We'll starve. Gettle, I said. There's the river. We can follow it back home. I can see Will's face now. Oh, it will be so good to get back to Draper's Meadow. And you can make a new life there with us. Come on, Gettle. I can't do it without you. I knew that evening our chance had come. I pantomimed and pointed to Galar's axe. I'll need something to chop these grapes with, I said. And he looked at me and handed me a sharp axe blade. Be careful. That's the best one I have, he replied. So gathering up the axe, Gevel and I each wrapped a blanket around our shoulders. The evenings were getting chilly. And we grabbed a basket to gather up food for the Frenchmen and the Indians. As soon as we got into the shadows away from the campfire, we ran as fast as our legs could take us. We ran deeper and deeper into the forest until finally we reached the riverbank, the Ohio. It was dark now. We found an old hollow log and scooted inside, brushing up leaves to hide the opening. And there we stayed. We heard engines pass close by a couple of times, but nary a sound did we make. They assumed that we'd either been killed by wild animals, fallen in the river and drowned because neither Gettle nor I could swim. The next morning, we rose early, staying away from the engine paths in the woods, started our journey back home. We had Indian moccasins on our feet, Clothes were tattered, but still together. There was plenty of food for that first month that we were on the trail. Berries and wild mushrooms and leaves, walnuts, wild grapes. One week after traveling, we found an old abandoned cabin. The first time that night we'd slept under roof since our capture in July. There was an old sway-backed horse out back with a bell hung round his neck, a couple of bags of corn that had been left when the settlers had fled. So putting as much corn as we could into burlap bags we found, we tied those onto the horse, and Gettle and I took turns riding. One week. After we had found this horse, we came to a dam across the Licky River. Since Gettle and I couldn't swim, we had to walk around these rivers and these streams until we could find the shallow place to walk across. We'd been searching now several days for additional food. It was getting harder and harder to find. Gettle, as always, was hungry. I'm so hungry, Mary. Why did I let you tuck me into this? There was a dam of old driftwood across this river. We can cross on that, she said. Come on, Mary. We can do it. We led the horse out midstream that poor critter got his leg caught fast. We took what 
bags of corn we could off his back and left the poor soul to die. How terrible to die alone in the wilderness. We'd lost all but one blanket. Wet, cold, we continued on. Finally, one day, and it was up into October by this time, after searching for food, Gettle lunged at me and tried to choke me. Maybe I'll eat you up, Mary Angus. I was younger and being faster of foot, was able to get away, and I raced down to the riverbank. There was an old canoe there, hidden amongst the leaves. It was the very canoe that the Shawnee had used to bring us across the river. Taking a branch from the riverbank, I used it as a paddle, and I paddled myself across to the other side. The next morning, I looked across, and there was the old Dutch woman at the edge of the riverbank. Mary, she called. Mary, I'm sorry. Please, please come back. I can't make it without you. <coughs> now, now, dear, I called. We will walk together. We'll just stay on either side of the river. Come on now. <coughs> the next morning, when I awoke, no signs of the old woman could I find. Had she been killed by wild animals, captured by a hunting party? I knew not what, but I knew I had to continue on my journey following that river back home to Virginia. It was getting colder now, more difficult to find things to eat. I even gnawed on the discarded head of a deer, ate some weeds and mushrooms that made me terribly sick. Finally, finally, I saw a landmark that I knew had brought me close to home. It was Anvil Cliff, a huge rock face rising 300 foot from the base of the New River. <clears throat> Draper's Meadow was on the other side, not 10 miles away. By this time, it was November. Feet bare and bleeding. Clothes in tatters. Hair snow white where it had been coal black only three months earlier. I knew it would take me half a day to climb the front of that cliff and another half day to get down to the other side. But right beyond that rock face was the cabin of the Harmons. They were a German family who had settled there with their two boys. Would they still be there? Would they have gone back for protection farther east? I knew not. I began to climb with sleet and snow blowing in my face. Midday, with fingertips bleeding, no feeling in my blue feet, I had reached the top and started down the other side. Just before nightfall, I saw a light in the Harmon's cabin, but I could not walk any further. I sank down in their cornfield and raised up a hand. Careful! 
Carol boys, said Mr. Harmon. There's hunting parties and war parties moving through here. You know, they came and killed Casper Barger and Mary Inkle's mother, and they killed her sister's babe last summer. Take these rifles and come with me and let's see. One of the Harmon boys almost shot me before his father yelled out, Wait! Lord, can that be? It looks like, it looks like Mary Ingalls. Her hair is white as the snow that's falling. Well, they carried me back to the cabin, and, and Mrs. Harmon was, was still there, and she bathed my blue feet and hands in warm water and fed me beef broth. And finally, after a day or so, I was, I was able to ask about, about Will and, and my brother Johnny. Were they safe, I asked? Now, now, Ms. Ingalls, they're safe. But they're up in Cheyenne country trying to see about Ransom and you and your boys and, and Betty back. Well, then I remembered about Gettle. And I told the story about her coming with me and, and following the river and, and making our escape. And I begged Mr. Harmon to, to go out and look for her. I'll do no such thing, he said. She tried to kill you. She didn't mean it, Mr. Harmon. Oh, please, please see if you can't rescue her. Well, he sent his two boys out to look for her. And, and on the second day, when they was following the riverbank, they looked across and did a sight they see. It was an old woman, an old gray-haired woman with a cowbell round her neck. And she was dressed in, in leather hunting breeches and jacket and riding a horse. And every few feet she'd ring that bell and say, Hello? Hello? Is there anybody out there? It was Gettle. They rescued her and brought her back to the Harmon cabin. And oh, what a sweet reunion we had. All was forgiven. Turns out that the day after we separated there by the river, she had found an old hunter's cabin with stew still warm in the pot over the campfire. There was leather breeches and a jacket there, and by chance a horse tethered out the back. So she'd been riding in comfort for those last several weeks, following the river back home. Two weeks later, Johnny and me, Will, returned, and we were all reunited. I begged them to move back east of the Alleghenies for safety. More Indian attacks were happening. Eventually, we were able to find out what had happened to me boys. Thirteen years later, we ransomed Thomas, our oldest son, back from the Shawnee. He had lived in the Indian nation so long, he no longer spoke any English. He would disappear for weeks at a time with a quiver of arrows over his back and a bow in his hand to hunt in the woods. We also learned that the boy Georgie had died not too long after being taken from me. It took me brother Johnny six years to find Bet up in Chillicothe. She was also ransomed back. And William and I went on to have four more children here in this log cabin that we built on the banks of the New River. Will applied for a, a ferry's license, and for years he ran the ferry boat.
taking settlers coming from the east across the New River to lands west of the Allegheny. He's been gone now, passed away many, many years ago, but yet I still live here in this one room cabin that he built for us. The children are here, and their children, my grandchildren. And whenever they stop by to visit and ask me about, tell us, Grandmere, tell us about following the river back home. I never tire 